I can hear your video oh. interview, but okay, better with time. I don't think I even have anything okay, open. I think it works. Oh, no, it wasn't. Never mind, it was mine. <laughs> Such a good start. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm excited to welcome Jason, a leading voice in Unity and C Sharp game development. You have helped countless developers navigate everything from efficient design patterns to performance optimization. Jason, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. It's always, a, it's always fun to chat about anything in this area. Yeah, true. Now, could you tell us what initially inspired you to specialize in this field? Honestly, I'm just curious about everything. Like, I, I didn't even start with games. I started, um, well, I, I went to college for games, but it was more just like anybody else. So you can see a wall of games behind me. I just like games, but I didn't choose it per se. I just, I just follow my kind of interests. And so I mm -hmm. worked for a while in a bank and then I did some software development for supermarkets and then I worked in websites and then databases and then I did some tablets apps back when Windows 8 was a thing for doing ta tablet apps for that um yeah and then I kind of given up on games because there wasn't much in Ireland for game development and so I just went to sort of enterprise software and DevOps and then randomly I joined the Oculus um Discord for for creating VR games and I was following the Kickstarter and just sort of going into that area and then I met a bunch of people, made a lot of little mini games there and it ended up sort of turning into a job. And that, now I've been doing Unity development and contracting for probably 10 years now. So yeah, wow. sort of a bit random. I got there in the end, I guess. Hmm. Very interesting journey. I love to hear more about your creative process. What steps do you take when approaching a new project or idea? I can get bored very easily. What keeps me interested is, is everything is always more complicated than you think. And that can be a bad thing or it can be a good thing. It can have you stuck on a project for a long time, or it can be a great way to sort of re-energize you if you're bored. So whenever I find some project I work on, I try to find a way to turn it into a learning project. If there's something in it that I can find exciting. So if I'm doing a UI, I will challenge myself to try to use, you know, monochromatic colors or something. Or if I'm doing something with some other design, I would sort of research Neumorphic and skeuomorphic design and try to figure out how to do that or level design I would research the use of stairs in high and low environments and how you might approach it differently and so whatever it is I'm doing it gives me a constant hook of a reason to keep being entertained by what I'm doing but the process wise um, I try I try to keep it simple because once I have the interest in what I'm doing, that'll fade quickly. Most people get bored <laughs> very quickly in what they're doing. So for me, it has to be tight loops. So I'll basically do um, from the book uh, Lean Startup, Eric Ries, there's this, there's this idea of uh, validated learning. So I basically come up with a theory. I say, is it fun too? Or would it be cool if, or would I enjoy X? And then I would just make the smallest test for that. Um, I would just use something like Trello or something simple and I'll repeat the loop and I'll just keep adding features and testing the theory. And that way, I, if I tr try to pick something too big, I'll never finish it. So I always try to keep the loops sort of small. Very interesting. We also have a comment. I know JavaScript. Can I shift to game development? Yeah, honestly, um, I say this a lot, that all software is basically the same. Like the hard thing to learn about software isn't the language. The hard thing to learn about software is the logic. So there's the concept of variables and flow and learning how everything works together. If you know that in one language, you'll quite easily transition to the next. So the way it usually works from what I've seen, and I do a lot of tutoring and I used to teach in, in back in college, I used to help out with something called Coder Dojo. Um, your first language will take you a year or two to be able to just work in. But your next language might take you two, three months. And then after that, it's two months-ish or less for every language because the, the core structure is always the same. So yeah, honestly, you can make a game in anything. Minecraft is in Java mm -hmm. and I mean, even though they're the same names, Java and JavaScript may not be the same, but there are a lot of JavaScript games. And I came from ActionScript 2, which is what a lot of Flash games were made in. And that looks a lot like JavaScript, very similar language, especially 2. 3 is a bit more object oriented, but you can make games in anything. So yeah, I, I'd have no problem with it. And coding isn't even the most important part, as uh, I'm sure you can attest to. It's stressful, but it's not. You have to know all the other stuff. You have to know how to place objects and how to manage things and the level design and the UI stuff. So yeah, it's. I wouldn't worry if programming is the thing that, that people are worried about. Mm -hmm. And now a question that popped into my head. Do you think that is there any dead programming language? Unfortunately, no. And that's only because what's funny is what's dead to one person is really alive to another. And I know this a lot from enterprise. For example, um, I used to work with a piece of software called Metastorm. 
Now, Metastorm is dead. You can't buy it anymore. It was a piece of software that was used by businesses internally to build what are called BPM processes or business process management tools. So basically, if you want to build a piece of software and you don't want to build an entire piece of software and all the management, but you want to manage sort of some internal rules. If someone wants to go on holiday, they need to ask James and he does the, if they want to build that rule, it's like, how much software do you want to build for that? And this is before like Notion and other web tools were available. You would write your own tools and this little piece of software would let you drag nodes together and sort of build very simple applications. And it would automatically build the database, automatically hook with a bunch of things and make a JavaScript front end. My point is that piece of software, as small as it is, is used by about 12 big companies. I'm talking like multi-million dollar companies. And there's like 50 people in the world who are really good at it. And at the time I was learning this thing and I could have just lived there for the rest of my life and done a you know, I could have earned a lot of money being one of the few people in the world who does this thing. And so a lot of large companies live forever on older languages because there needs to be someone to manage this thing. No one's going to rewrite 30 years of existing software. And so whatever language you like, you will find somebody who will pay you to use it, guaranteed. Now, a question that's likely on many minds. Why haven't you posted on YouTube recently? Is there any chance you'll return to the platform? I have been thinking about it. I actually put a video on my second channel, uh, just Jason Story 2, a couple days mm -hmm. last week, I think, where I was just talking about how I use my tools and automation and stuff. Um, mostly it just comes down to what I said earlier about interest is I have to find a, a, a new thing that excites me or kind of gets me interested. I was listening to the mix and jam interview you did and very similar <laughs> thing. It's like, it needs to be, there needs to be something exciting or interesting to kind of, to get my attention. Um, and I find the problem is a lot of this stuff I look into is very complicated and, um, it's one thing to learn how to do something. It's a whole other thing to turn it into content. So once you've decided what it is, you have to figure out how do I, am I teaching it or am I showing it off? If I'm showing it off, am I explaining complicated parts of it or am I trying to demonstrate why it's useful? And so that's the tough part for me. If I'm, I'm debating doing some more kind of live things or just maybe recording while I work and then cutting it up in the videos or something, but coming up with formulated videos has been far too much work after learning something that I'm trying to find a simpler approach, but I do want to make more content and I have time now. I've, um, I've recently had a bit more free time to work on things. so. It's it's on the cards. There's I've I've got my videos set up and everything, so we're we're working on things. I'm happy to hear that though. I really like your videos and also thank you very much for watching that interview. It means a lot for real. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's good. Like like you said, in your own stuff, it's it's yeah. fun talking to different people and seeing their perspectives and, and um, you know, where where we relate on certain things. It's always kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Just like I said in the interview with Kyle Banks, even though maybe I have a few similar questions. The answers are always different, even though it's the same field, of course. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. I, oh, one thing I always say is because um, people always ask, "How do I enter this industry, or how do I start a job like yours?" And I always say the unfortunate answer is if you ask someone who won the lottery how to get rich, they'll tell you buy a lottery ticket, and that's <laughs> terrible advice. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that it's it's. Uh, wrong all the time but every person's journey is going to be entirely related to who, who they know where they were and the industry changes what was popular at one time isn't another so even the kinds of things you learned won't be the same and so it's not really i think always be careful of advice that people give you and look at it more as the lessons of how they approach things rather than the specifics because too many people try to follow a path someone took and that path doesn't exist after one person has you know walked it wise yeah that's true. So Unity is a powerful tool with countless possibilities. What do you see as its biggest strength for indie developers and how have you tailored your workflow to maximize its potential? I say that 100% it's the fact that it's been the most multi-platform game engine of all of them, uh, which a lot of people undervalue because they often just produce for PC. And if they don't, they might produce for one or two other consoles. And if you've ever gone down that path, it's very tedious because um, you have to actually get uh, official support for like Sony or, or uh, Nintendo, they will, they want a lot from you and you have to sign things and you have to use specialized versions of software. It's not as simple as just deciding to press build for that platform. Um, but you can increase your sales by up to 40% on each of those new releases in a lot of cases. Uh, or in my case, I do a lot of non game dev stuff in unity, which people are often surprised by is there's tons of software out there. And at the end of the day, unity is a rendering engine. So for me, the ability to post to the web or to phones or tablets, the amount of times I've worked with client stuff where 
they might have a desktop like large screen 40 inch thing for a museum or something but they might want a tablet app that will be able to control aspects on the screen and i can just say cool i'll just make you a tablet app and i can just connect to the same port or but and it's the, for me it's the same thing because there's not much complexity in switching in unity so nothing else beats the level of just choose a platform press build if you manage things correctly I'm willing to learn more and discover Unity because I feel like it's my favorite. <laughs> I haven't tried in depth the other ones, but I don't know why Unity feels like the best one out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is, and this goes back to what I said before about how the journey changes. I say this as someone who's very pro Unity is I don't even know if that's entirely, if it's the best anymore for what we're doing, but it is something that's still very powerful because the thing about Unity is it has, it's been around for so long with so much resources, it's got so many things to learn from. And so yes, there's things like ChatGPT that'll sort of consume a lot for you, but there's tons of videos on every topic you'd want to learn from. And the, the interesting thing I find with Unity is if you're doing things in .NET and C Sharp specifically, that is very transferable. Without going into the whole history of programming languages, uh, C Sharp was basically uh, Microsoft's attempt at stealing Java developers away from their work to move into .NET. And so they made it look a lot like Java when they made it. So C Sharp looks like Java. Java is one of the most famous programming languages in the world. C Sharp looks a lot like it. And then there's all the offshoots, like you've got F Sharp and object oriented programming and stuff. So unlike other engines where you're using a specific scripting language, if you learn Unity, you've learned how to program in .NET, which is one of the most prolific programming languages out there. So it's it's very accessible. It's very easy if you've come from enterprise to come into it, and it's very good to transfer those skills to other places. If you use certain game engines, they're really powerful for certain things, but you're gonna find those skills are for that engine and that engine only, and that can be a bit tougher for getting other jobs. But the I used to say Unity strength was game jams. It was very much the pick up, press play build, but now the, the the industry's gotten a lot wider and honestly you can do anything now you've got construct you've got godot you can build a game jam in anything because it used to be unity was the only one you could press play and make a web build on and that was phenomenal the fact that you could make a shareable build so someone didn't have to download software but again because that's not the only one anymore they're all equally viable so i would say it's at least worth giving a two-week challenge to each engine just to play with it to see what you feel about each one um because you'll find that a lot of the ideas are the same but the actual names or tooling will change uh it, it'll get a bit confusing learning why they call them pawns in unreal or what they do over here but but fundamentally you'll find that it's less scary to realize that most engines are solving the same problem they just might have slightly different approaches to that mm -hmm. we also got a question from carl that asks can you make a desktop application with unity if yes is it recommended uh, you can, yeah. and honestly, desktop is one of the better ones, I think. The only one I'm very cautious on is I would never make a mobile application in Unity because it runs very hot and you can't turn off the rendering side of it. A good example of this is Pokemon Go, where it's in Unity and it basically, you have to have it on to use because you can't do background processes the same way as a native application. And it'll like melt your phone's battery. It'll well, not melt, but it'll like lower it really quickly and it won't run very long. Uh, but you don't have that problem on desktop. So I've made many little applications um, and because it's .NET, you use the entire any DLL or um, piece of software or library you can find, you can use. So people think of it as a game engine, but I've used it for um, scraping metadata for TV shows and making folders. And I've um, organized, I, I've connected to Todoist or Marvin or various things I've wanted to connect to my own stuff. You can connect to databases, you can consume any web services. It's basically just a screen that draws things. And so if you think of it that way, the truth is you can make anything in it. There's actually a really good uh, modeling tool. I can't remember the name of it, but it's on itch. Uh, it's like a kind of a, a very small modeling thing where it's got a bunch of preset shapes and you can compose a model and press export. It'll export out a model for you. Really good for quick game jam games where you can build like Lego block together things like spaceships in a really quick way. My one asterisk, like I said, is it's not great for standalone Android applications. It's fine for tablet apps and things where you're leaving them on to use for a task. But if it's an ongoing running app, it, it can be quite bad for battery life. They said Asset Forge by Kenny or something? Might be Asset Forge, yeah, that could be it. Carl also says, yep, Unity is best. I tried Unreal, I hated it. Just for compiling, it takes a long time and sometimes it breaks. That Okay, well, that is true. And so funnily enough, people look at um, Unity as my main engine, but I have done the full lot. My very first engine was, um, so it was ActionScript first, then I moved on to XNA, 
and then from X and A, I moved on to Unreal, or at the time it was called UDK, because Unreal was the paid engine you had to use, and uh, that cost like twenty thousand to license. <laughs> that was how much it cost to even get access to use it. Oh. Um, and so they had the 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 learning version called UDK, or Unreal Development Kit. And that was the one you could play with yourself and make things with. And unlike sort of what we're used to now, when you pressed play in UDK, you were actually dropped into an Unreal Tournament map. Like it was the full map, you were holding a gun, it had but it was like a very much, this is, this is what this is. It's not made for you as a game engine, but you can use it as one if you'd like, if you want to take the time to learn. And it was great fun and you could do all sorts of various things with it. And so I, I learned that way. And before they had the visual scripting, they had other similar tools. There was one called Kismet for kind of their version of the stitching logic together. Um, and it had a lot of really cool toys. It was like the world's best level editor. You could do, you could drop stuff in, you could make flash games and all sorts of cool stuff, but it was very hard to customize, to make game stuff with. You had to learn how it worked exactly. Um, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it. My, my, my short answer I give people is if you're making games by yourself, Unreal, uh, Unreal is not ideal because it's very technical in each area. If you have four or five people and one person can dedicate themselves to certain areas, you could do really good stuff. But if you're learning everything yourself, Unity will help you out a lot more at some of those earlier stages. What are the biggest challenges you face in your work and how do you approach overcoming them? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, one of the biggest challenges in specifically what I do is I do a lot of consulting and contracting. So a lot of people in the Unity or game dev space work for themselves. And one thing you take for granted is you know what you want. But if you work for other people, you don't really know what they want. And mm -hmm. people think it's easy, but it really isn't. Even someone who knows what they want have a really hard time explaining it. And you, you get to this really weird scenario where they try to use your language, where they like, they're trying to talk in game development terms to you, but they don't really know game development terms. And so you get a lot of confusion and back and forth. And so that to me is one of the biggest things to learn if you find yourself working with other people is you have to learn how to communicate. And more than that, how to figure out when someone is failing to communicate and help them. And so um, one of the things I do a lot is there's loads of great books on basically business and, and uh, project management and those kinds of things. And they teach you how to talk to people and get ideas from them. So for me, one of the biggest challenges to work with is when you meet someone new is try to talk around the project first, find out what their goals are. Because oftentimes they'll say, we need a project that does this. You'll be like, hang on a second, is your goal to do this? And they say, yes, okay, well then actually we could do it A, B, or C. And they're like, oh, that'll be easier. A, a simple example I, I usually give is I worked with one client and they asked for a Skype type integration into the application. Now, they don't really want Skype. That, that's not what they meant. They meant a video player. So that's already not quite the same thing. Someone who wasn't really paying attention might have gone off and tried to figure out how to put Skype into Unity and they would have been on the wrong track altogether. The second thing is once I've talked to them more, they were like, oh, we just need people to communicate. And I was like, well, video and audio can be done separately. And if you do video, you have to deal with the extra bandwidth and the costs and the issues with that. And so after we went back and forth, they realized all they actually wanted was the ability to have voice over IP. Just a very simple, add some pun voice. And I could have wasted a lot of time and their money and everything else if I wasn't really listening to what their actual goals are. They're just using the language they're familiar with saying do things in Skype. So uh, mm -hmm. learning communication skills, as silly as it sounds, is probably one of the number one things that I recommend for, for the kind, if you do get into consulting and contracting, you need to know when to not waste your time and theirs, you know? Thank you very much. You didn't expect this answer. <laughs> Yeah, Carl also says why JavaScript was removed from Unity. I think Unity supported JavaScript and JJ said, yeah, including Boo language. Yes, Boo, Boo was the language the game Thomas was alone is written in Boo. Unity technically never supported JavaScript. This is one of those little like asterisks. It doesn't really support JavaScript. What it would do is it would let you write JavaScript-like syntax. So, the, so it would look like you're writing JavaScript and then it would convert that to C-sharp behind the scenes for you. Hmm. And that had some real good strengths and weaknesses. The strengths were, if you were familiar with JavaScript, it's like, cool, I can just write the language I'm used to. Except there's edge cases where it wouldn't quite work as expected. And if you would download assets, you'd have to download some assets in C-sharp, some in JavaScript. And if you were an asset developer, you'd have to produce assets on different sides. And there was ways to communicate back and forth with these like protocol stuff. Um, long story short, it was a real mess. If you were an asset developer, you would have twice as much work. If you're someone learning, you didn't know if the tutorial you were following is going to be in JavaScript or in C Sharp and when it would be the ones that would work or not. Um, and so just like people complain now about the multiple rendering pipelines, which they're now moving away from, say, imagine that, but on the actual programming language itself. Imagine your entire project is bouncing back and forth between three languages and you're trying to figure out whose scripts and what and how do I communicate between those. 
So that's why they got rid of it. And I think it was a good thing they did. From your perspective, what are some common mistakes that beginners make in Unity and how can they uh, sidestep these pitfalls? Oh, there's so many you go through. I, I, I would say... <laughs> Name all. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll split it into two categories. Okay. Uh, the first is, if you come from, I'd say, normal coding, or, or if you have a job in programming or software, you'll often come to game development and try to apply what you learned over there, over here. And it sounds obvious, like, I went and learned programming here, it should be the same thing. But paradigms are hugely different. In enterprise development, for example, you're building an application like we talked about, it's, it's what's considered event-driven applications. So it's you're building applications where the goal is, wait till someone clicks something, respond. And so the things you can get away with in terms of time and development are very different than what are called loop-driven applications, which are games, which are constantly running a, a you know frames per second loop. And so a lot of the, the best practices or things you've learned don't really apply back and forth because memory is more important in games and the efficiency of how things and pipelines work when consistency of rules is more important for business applications. So if you're dealing with banking software, you want to make sure that, that you can't accidentally put a zero and add, you know, on an account balance or something. But in a game, we don't really mind if things, the numbers go a bit crazy, as long as it renders fast and we can kind of fix those numbers as we go. So the, the entire philosophy of design is very different between both sides. So if you come from enterprise, take your time to do it the Unity way. A lot of people basically, what I say is fight Unity when they first move into Unity. Because there's it's, it uses a model called um, a component architecture. And if you've never used a component architecture, you might think this is wrong, I can do it better using my way that I learned from my software and you'll, you'll make it harder for yourself. And I say this because I did that for two years. <laughs> so don't do that. Don't waste your time trying to apply what you know from somewhere else over. Um, that's one. And then on the other side, you've got people who come to Unity first and they're basically Learn, writing scripts and doing sort of simple things. Um, the obvious answer there is tutorial hell, as everyone calls it, which is you hit this wall where you start following guides and they're great, but there's this like zone of comfort where you're like, I know just enough that I can keep repeating these. I can keep doing shooting demos and I can keep doing little towers and things. And I've learned that and I've watched 50 videos on it. And there's like the next step seems impossible because there's always tutorials for here then a big gap and the tutorials for here and like nobody knows how to cross that boundary and everyone's really confused and you kind of get stuck here because it's comfortable and the the trick that i recommend is you always want to be slightly further than your level of comfort if you're finding everything easy or you're thinking that it's that nothing seems particularly uh confusing then you can live there forever and you'll never really learn anything and you won't you won't be happy with yourself doing things. If you're trying to make an MMO for your first game, you're looking at the wrong direction and you're way past your skill level and you'll end up wasting your time and building things that you won't be happy with. The answer is to find something that sounds easy and then like add a twist to it. Just push a little bit more and go, could I add X to it? Could I make it a bit more complicated? Because everything will always be more complicated than you think. So pick something you've never heard about and just a little bit more and keep pushing yourself slightly out of your comfort zone. And that's how you'll always feel like you're learning something new. Just like we did in the live stream when you joined and you told exactly, me about yeah. the sounds. Thank you very much for yeah. that. Yeah, it's out. Happy to help. Yeah, the game, game. I mean, the demo is out now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I saw I saw your video on it. Yeah, oh, so it's, it's, good, it's, it's good to complete it. Like you finished the loop and you had the, the different oh, UI set up. And it, it's always good to explain that too to people, that mm -hmm. the, the process that to your, as you even did in the video, your ideas change, right? Like you do a UI, it looks finished. Some people might give up and say, well, it's done. But you know, you had a goal, you changed it and you showed how it changes over time. I love that with, with watching video essays and um, devlogs because a lot of people miss that part. They kind of, when you see a finished product, it looks like it's done. But no, actually, oftentimes people change their mind and it goes through multiple variations. And it's good to set that expectation. Otherwise people get frustrated early and think, I can't just press a button and make it work like, Sebastian Lag does. And it's like, no, watch his videos again. He regularly shows how he's wasted hours trying to solve the small problem. You know? Yeah, I think I have more failures than success in general in this field. So this is why I feel like doing exactly what I'm doing and not pretending, oh, you know, this is the final mm -hmm. product. Because it's not. It's not like the frustration is definitely there. Carl also asks, is Unitask recommended over Cortin? I use ChatGPT to replace Unitask with Cortin. Uh, so I'll explain what they are just so everyone's familiar. Um, Thank you. So <laughs> in, in Unity, when you write code, it's, it's as I said, it's a loop driven uh, system. So if I write print hello in a loop, it'll print hello as many times or ticks as the game can do. And the tick is based on frame rate. So if the game is running at 60 frames a second, it'll print hello 60 times. Um, and that's fine, but oftentimes you've got work that needs doing, like load all things in the level. 
and that's going to take longer than 60 frames to load everything. And so what you want to do is split that up over multiple steps. And the way you do that is you can run things. P people think about it in terms of parallel, but it's not actually in parallel. What a coroutine does is it says, do this thing and then just wait until the end of the next frame. Now do this bit. So if I know I'm doing a lot of work, I can basically split it up into chunks and then and do each chunk, say, load 10% this frame, then 10% percent next frame, 10%, and that'll avoid it stuttering. Otherwise it'll freeze for the duration as it loads and then it'll come back again and you don't want it to do that. Um, so coroutines are great, but the mistake people make is they think coroutines are asynchronous. They think they run parallel to the game. They don't, it just cuts the work up between multiple frames. And then the reason people mention Unitask is Unitask is parallel. It can run multiple things in using the task parallel library, which is part of .NET. Um, and it is powerful to do that, but tasks get very hairy very quickly because you're literally on the computer taking a piece of work and throwing it to different processes to do things and you have to sort of stitch them all back together at the end. And you can find things like if it throws an error over here, but you're not actually listening because you're over here, you don't see the error and suddenly it doesn't just show you the error, it disappears. The error is gone now. You're, whatever it was doing just failed. So you have to understand all these extra complicated things. Short answer is it's useful, but I don't think it's recommended or one of those things you should use unless you already have it working or you're comfortable. If you are the kind of person who comes from, again, other software and you're very familiar with task development and you know how to do locks, if, if you don't know what returning to uh, the scheduler means or how to return to a scheduler, don't touch any of that stuff for now. Optimization is important, but you've already got enough to learn making a game that you should make learn how to make games first. And then once you're the kind of person who makes games, you can learn how to make performant games. But if you start by throwing yourself a whole load of extra toys and complicated things to learn, you won't have you won't have fun. It'll be more of a headache and you'll give up sooner and you're better off making things and then making better things, keeping on that edge of comfort rather than picking all the tools you see other people use and making your life harder, you know. And the best way of learning how to make games is start. <laughs> to start. Okay. Yeah, like um, all the jokes aside, I think the truth is um, just pick something you enjoy and start doing it. Like it's it's. Uh, I could go on a whole big essay on this. Is that I I do think making something is like three parts. It's what what's exciting enough to get you started, what'll keep you going if you're feeling low motivation, and then how do you actually keep going after you finish projects? Because you could be really excited and keep going but then work for three years, it doesn't do what you want and then get fed up and give up. So each phase has a different motivation or reasoning behind it. But as far as getting started, that's the easy part. That's just basically find something cool within reason, learn how it works and make it. And if it turns out it's too big, pick a smaller piece and keep doing that till you find something that you can achieve. And there's lots of really cool things you can achieve in a very short amount of time. Um, if you want to make, again, large game like a first-person shooter, you won't do that in the first week. That just won't happen. But if you instead go to uh, Coding Train or um, Nature of Code is, is the is the YouTube channel portion, uh, or follow, you know, Bracky's early tutorials or something, you can get a character moving on screen in a day. And, like, that gets you started. And just basically do that, is find something cool and make something, show it to people, keep it going. Getting started is the easy part. It's, it's going to be the later parts that are where it really starts to, to be hard. One question from JJ. He says, using Unity for a few years, I am good enough to help beginners with code and Unity, but I feel like I have reached a point where I'm not learning anything new. Like I'm stuck. What to do? Any advice? Yeah, that's, that's exactly that plateau I was talking about, where you hit this sort of area where if you keep following all the online tutorials, they stop here. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is, People say, I want a full game I can learn from. I want this completed finished project. I wish I could just download a full game and read through it. And the unfortunate truth is that won't help you. That's not that like everyone wants that, but it won't help you because if I gave you a finished Eiffel Tower, you're not going to learn how to build an Eiffel Tower out of that. That's not going to help you learn how to make that thing because what you're seeing is the result of decisions that have been made, but you don't know why those decisions were made or who made them or how many or how the process went. Um, what you need instead is to be always pushing past that boundary. And so what I do personally when I'm learning something new is I go to the furthest edge of what I know and I basically say, and this is going back to ChatGPT, is I don't ask it to give me the answer. I say, I have this, I want it to be this. Give me five ways people would solve this problem. I don't need the details, I just need to know how could you solve this problem. A good example is I want to save my game file. How could I do that? And if you ask it, it'll say, well, you could save it as JSON, you could save it as a binary uh, array, or you could save it as uh, to a web service. And it'll go, oh, and then you can stop and go, 
Why would I pick that one? Well, if you save it to JSON, it's easy to edit. And if you save it as binary, it'll be smaller and faster. And it'll give you all the answers. And once you've learned the area, you can then pick one and go, right, now that I know that I need this, let's drill down into that area. So the truth is you're not gonna find the tutorial that gets you what you want. All tutorials will end where it makes sense for the creator because at some point, it's just not worth it. And without going to analytics on it, any series that goes past three episodes has like a 50% drop off rate immediately. Uh, people watch the first episode and the last episode and nobody watches the middle ones because what everyone does is they want to see how it starts. Then they cut to the end to see how it looks and they decide, eh, should I bother watching? And they'll skim through some of the others. And that's consistent across every series on YouTube or other platforms. So nobody's going to build a whole thing like that when it won't, it won't work for anybody. People won't learn from it and it won't be valuable for them to make. So if you really want to get better, you have to pick a goal that is slightly harder than you think it is, or slightly past where you are, and then just slowly move towards it. And again, you can use tools like ChatGPT or, or online searches, but you have to actually like learn a problem. Like I want to, I want to make 500 chips fly around. It's like, well, okay, to do that, how would I do that? I need to learn how to do it efficiently because it'll be too expensive. So you need to learn about space partitioning. That, not, that might not have been the words you typed in the search, but you'll learn that in order to do that, you need space partitioning. And I, now you know the name of the thing to learn, and now you can go and learn space partitioning. And it'll kind of step you through those phases. Back to my questions. Is there one project you're especially proud of? And what made it stand out to you? So there's been a few cool ones. I, I like seeing projects that people actually use for their work. So I will say before the game dev stuff, I used to work in building software internally. and. One of my favorites is I had to build a little scanner application for somebody. Um, they have to, to scan products and do things. And getting to write that is really rewarding because your people are actually using it. And every tweak you make, like someone came back to me once and said, there's a little pop-up box and it's really annoying. Every time I press it, I have to scan, press the pop-up and I remove that. And they say, you have to my time at work. Like literally removing that pop-up box. Like I don't have to move my hand to press the button each time. And that's great fun just to see it actually make practical benefit to people. Um, for games and things, I've worked on a few projects, which is again, fun to see people play in VR. Um, the most recent one was one called, um, Starship Home. I think that came out two months ago, a month ago, um, on Quest 3. And that's really cool. I got to work on some fun stuff on that. It's a uh, little, uh, little plants that you place in mixed reality. And then you turn your room into a spaceship and you fly to different planets and collect plants. And there's this musical element and stuff to that, uh, to do some of those. That, that was fun. Um, I worked on a, a, a firefighting tank that was sort of a prototype for, um, so there was a real tank with a real like water turret on it. And um, they wanted controls for that sort of to, to work with VR controllers. And so I'm they, the tank is in America somewhere and I'm looking at someone on Skype and I'm writing code and sending them something. And so here I, I'm holding a VR controller and they're like standing beside a tank and I'm doing this and I'm watching the, the tank turn. It's just yeah. really cool. And so yeah. there's, the thing about contracting is there's, I've just done so many like random little projects that it's always fun just to see what people want. And that's why I, that's why I kind of get bored easily. And so with a game, you're working on one thing for two years, but the kind of stuff I do, someone just once has a cool idea and I get to be the person to help them make the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really nice being there helping both sides now talking about vr and all this stuff which re recent trends or developments in game dev excite you the most oh so i'm kind of out of the vr stuff a bit i do still for work but i haven't been playing much of them so i'm not really sure where we are on that but i will say personally what excites mm. me the most is i'm a big fan of narrative games the, i mm. i think interactive narrative is one of my favorite style of game um there's a load of random stuff here like uh lighthouse which is in the old sierra games mm. um which are just these really weird adventure games and those are the ones i really grew up with and loved um and for a while it felt like everything pushed to open world and open world is fine technically but it loses story um without getting the whole big thing of why i breath of the wild for example is a really good game but i never felt it was a good zelda game because what i consider a zelda game is not in breath of the wild or the rest of them because the philosophies of the games have changed and so with uh, the release of Baldur's Gate, I think it's reminding people that story games are really fun, that are like people like stories again. Um, and so that's what excites me is I want to see, it doesn't have to be giant RPGs, but I really want to see um, more Disco Elysiums, more games where people are um, really playing with medium as like an interactive and a narrative. And with the latest uh, Call of Duty having a really good single player campaign, which hasn't happened in years, uh, is, is fun to see. So I think the kind of return to more linear and story based things is exciting to me. And I hope that because they can be cheaper to make as well at times. So I, that's, that's my hope. I hope I see more games that are 
eight to 12 hour fun narrative experiences that sort of say something, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Also, I really like your background and I wanted to ask about the stuff behind you. So thanks for oh, showing sure. us. <laughs> no, like, yeah. oh my God, it's just <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, my God. Oh um, my goodness. I love them. So yeah, I've got um, Jack's mask from Fable, uh, Jack of Blades. I've got Tracer's gun from uh, Overwatch. Um, I have a whole bunch of retro games. And my my, it's really cool actually. I found someone on Etsy who turned out to live around the corner. I didn't know this. I, I ordered on Etsy a wooden, real wooden replica of the uh, Kuriko of uh, the shield from Zelda: Green of Time. And turns out the guy was like, I actually live around the corner. Do we deliver it to you? And so the guy actually brought Whoa. it over, which is very cool. Wow, damn, that's so cool. Once I, I'm gonna move, because now, you know, I pay the rent and I'm a student and this mm -hmm. all this stuff. Once I will live alone, I said one room, one entire room will be dedicated to video games and just yeah. all this stuff. I was the same. For yeah. years, I was the same. I was like, oh, I'll just move. I'm, I'm never gonna settle down. I won't bother. And then I started doing YouTube stuff and I was like, okay. I'm, I'm going to do the YouTuber thing. And I sat down and I researched all different stuff. I got the famous Kallax cubes back there because they're really good for showing little kind of things. And I, I found old games I wanted to get collections of. And mm -hmm. I, I now have the full <laughs> the YouTuber background. And it is fun. It's nice having having a place that sort of represents you and all of the like weird games that you particularly grew up with that may not be the popular ones that other people remember, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. I also want to put something on my walls because I feel like they're way too empty and this is not my personality. So, mm. yeah, I totally understand. One of my favorite things I have is, it's out of frame, unfortunately, but I have a full replica of Majora's Mask from Majora's Mask. It's this full, actual, like, giant mask been hand-painted and stuff. It's gorgeous. It's, it's my, it's, if the whole place is on fire, it's probably the thing I'd grab as I was running out the door, so... <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Carl also asks why Unity Dots is so hard. Oh yeah, Dots is very hard. And the reason Dots is hard is because it's a fundamentally different architecture. So I mentioned Overwatch earlier. Overwatch is written in, it's not Dots, but it's the same architectural principles that Dots is built on. Because it's not in Unity, but it uses the same philosophy of design. There's loads of ways to think about software. It gets really technical into how the, the memory is stored. But the basic idea is when you write games, there's there's things that make sense for you as a designer and there's things that make sense for um the other person here's a, here's a really silly example um if you go to a restaurant that deals with lots of people it might make more sense linguistically to communicate by saying table number five has ordered a burger and a salad and whatever but that's very slow and if you're doing that all the time you're not going to get through as many customers as you need to but if you learn the sort of like sub language of saying seven for five, like what's that? Table seven, well, you know, mm -hmm. what's that? Seven, number seven for table five, then internally you build a system that's considerably faster. And the thing about Dots is Dots is sort of speaking more to the memory managed side of how the software works. And you have to learn how to speak that language basically. And it's going to be a lot harder because you're learning more closely how the computer thinks, how it basically packages memory and how it stores things in contiguous arrays. And you're trying to learn how to manage that information in a way that marshals data back and forth, because the way computers work is kind of like a kitchen because it's in a, in a restaurant, you've got front of house, back of house, and each area does their own job. You've got people, it's like whole different buildings and, and you communicate by sending food back and forth and orders. And so with the computer, you've got these pipelines between the graphics and the rest of the system. And so each one of these pipelines has communication channels and basically it gets very complicated and it's useful to learn because it's very good to know these things. It helps you make good decisions. But going back to what we said before, once you learn to make games, you can then learn to make performant games. But first learn to make games. <laughs> it's more important than, than getting too hung in the weeds on, on what specific people or engines or whatever people do. Also, another interesting question. Why big AAA studios avoid Unity most of the time and prefer Unreal? Unreal is hard and bloated. Well, again, that's also very complicated. Well, the truth is most engines originally, most studios preferred their own engine. That was the short answer. Right up until very recently, every studio used their own game engine. And the answer is simply, it's faster once you get started. Once you've built your engine, um, it works exactly for what you want to do. And it's everyone in-house already knows how to use it and you can solve your own problems. The other side of the coin would be using someone else's tools and dealing with whatever features they have, but then you don't have access to the source code. And so some engines you'd have to pay extra to get access to the source code. And so you can do that. You could do that with Unity and you could do that with Unreal where you can pay them extra money to get access to the source code and make modifications. 
but companies didn't want to do that because now their entire company is built on another company. If that company doubles their prices or comes up with a terrible business model that annoys everybody, then they're in trouble, right? And they don't want to do that. And so for years, nobody wanted to use a different engine. Um, and that changed once people started to weigh the costs. Unreal is a very industry heavy tool. And so you've got a lot of very well-trained professional people who are now older who have been using that for years. So if you're making a game, if you start in Unity, you've got a lot of younger people who know Unity, but a lot of the older people were familiar with Unreal. And so they're going to hire the people who have more experience making those kinds of games. And then the problem is once you've started that, you're going to stay that way. If I've built three games now in Unreal with people I know, I'm going to keep making games in Unreal with people I know. And so Unity would be, you'd have to start with a new engine with new people. And that's not to say it can't be done, but it has to be a risk. And as we all know in the games industry, they don't like risk. Risk is a very dangerous thing. And so companies would rather build their own thing than kind of lean into a different engine. How do you see the game development field evolving over the next few years? And where do you think indie developers will fit in? Well, with, with the modern nonsense going on, it's very hard to know the answer to that question. I think anybody who says they know the answer is probably lying. I think the, the, the truth is more... The one thing I would say is, is everyone talks about AI. And I admit, I like the phrase people say AI is like a train. You have an option to be in front of it, on it, or under it. And so these days you have to make your decision. You have to decide to be on board to some degree. It doesn't mean you have to use it every day, but you need to understand it well enough to know what it can or can't do, or it'll pass you by. And so it's worth, if, if, you, just, if you are going to be in games, you need to at least know it enough to give more substantial critiques than just saying, I don't like it because it steals art. I mean, that's a, that's a fair complaint, but you should know what you're complaining about effectively because it's going to be important to you. So I think that's probably the biggest thing is AI will be used in games. We could argue if it's a good thing or a bad thing as a separate conversation, but it will happen. And so people, that's going to be the biggest change. It's going to become a part of games for no other reason than games are very expensive. And the current drop off with the games industry is most is more to do with over hiring during the pandemic than it is anything else. A lot of people think the games industry is crashing. It totally isn't. It's it's actually still got more hiring now than it did pre pandemic. It's just the, it looks bad because people are averaging back out for all of the mistaken over hiring that was done before. Um, but the model's not sustainable. Just like with TV before, a lot of people didn't realize that the Netflix in a way kind of killed television production because of the, there's a whole philosophy of why that's a, a problem for the, it did a lot of damage to its own industry in a way that it didn't realize it was doing and games are going a similar way. And so what's going to happen is there'll be a lot more smaller games made. Games made were the focus on cutting down costs for development and that's going to include a lot of AI. And so the question is, how can we still keep some, some honest art and interesting stuff going on in an environment that's going to be aiming towards smaller and more tooling. And so I think the best way to do that is to understand the tools and to figure out a way to create good things with them. Also, Phil says use AI as Google. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that it's personally, I think it's terrible for that. Like it's, it comes down to what you want to use it for. Um, a lot of people will, will use ChatGPT, for example, and say, write me the answer to this problem. But that's, it's really bad at that. It's actually, that's not what it's good for at all. The description I used earlier about using it to ask questions is what it's good for. Think of it as um, hiring a bad assistant. <laughs> like you might, if you're hiring an assistant who's only half listening to you, that's not really interested in the job. You don't want to give them really important stuff and you don't want them to give, you don't want to ask them to do things where it's ac the accuracy is important. But what you do is you can give them work that will be a lot of time and they can cut the time down for you. And so for me, I use it for things like how might I do this problem? There's 10 ways I could do it. Tell me what different ways I could approach it. Or what are the what are the things I should consider? And then once it's given me the kind of the legwork, it's gone and run around and collected things for me. It's my job to <laughs> fix it and sort it and organize it because I can't trust the reliability of the, the tooling. And so I think, I think going forward, it's really bad for things where you want direct answers, but it's really good for just collating information for you. Um, but if you are going to use AI, perplexity is the best Google search at the moment of all of the tools. Marl also asks if Asset Flip is bad, why do they make assets free and public domain? Asset Flips is actually, so I, I, on my Discord, that's one of the biggest conversations. We talk about Asset <laughs> Flips a lot and the use of assets and various things. And people know I, I have an interesting relationship with that particular question because I think assets are fine and they're actually very practical, um, but you have to use them correctly. Uh, a good example of this would be games like David Whaley's The First Tree. Exactly, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. like he, made, he made a very good top-selling multi-platform game um, because he learned that the trick was lean into what he can do and outsource what he can. So he bought models and then he painted the textures himself. If he hadn't painted the textures himself, it would have looked like an asset flip. 
Um, it, it's why I personally don't recommend people use Sinti characters as their primary character, because if you put a Sinti face on your thumbnail, it's a Sinti character. There's no way around it. It looks exactly like every other Sinti character. So feel free to use assets, but you use them to sort of prop up areas, things that are like trees, backgrounds, or build things where it's not the core of your game. But whatever the identity of your game is, those shouldn't be asset flips. But yeah, other than that, it's the other part of it too, without getting into too much detail on, on assets. The problem with assets is a lot of assets are to sell on an asset store. They have to look really cool, but that, to look really cool, they have to be very unique. But if they're really unique, you can't add a single unique thing to your game if you now can't make other things like it, which means you have to hire people to make matching things or buy more from the developer and they won't always have what your game needs in particular. So you have to find a middle ground between buying things that will fit your game, but in a way that you can modify them so they support what you're building. So it can be complicated. I also use a lot of asset flips because I feel like I have to do a lot of projects for the university, right? And there's a lot of time pressure. So I feel like I don't have enough time to actually start modeling them myself, piece by piece and everything. So I take them from the Unity Asset Store. But yeah, I think what you just said, it's very important to keep in mind while you create your own stuff that you want to launch, of course, because during summer, I started to work on a game by myself, just out of nowhere. Literally, I had this one idea of creating something and um, I just import a lot of stuff that don't really go along with each other, but I use colors that somehow match. And I feel like the main character, it's something that I have to work on myself, so no one else will use it or have it. I totally agree. Like the, mm -hmm. Something I always say is like a magic trick for games is if you learn how to do post-processing, it's kind of like this super magic trick that will take a load of stuff that looks different. And if you can just paint the screen a certain color, add a little bit of shading and things and texture a few things, you can make anything work well together. Um, I definitely, and to your point, I agree. The, the main character, I think, should always be whatever the unique thing of your game is. And mm -hmm. just, just make sure that that is, that is recognizable in a thumbnail because um, it, we're talking about things that game devs earlier that, that they're kind of miss or don't use. Marketing is a big one. And that's not to say you should waste all your time doing it, but learn a couple of fundamentals. And one of them is have something that's unique, have something you can at least, it's visually distinct of some kind. It needs to be some way for people to look at and go, if I see a screenshot, I know it's your game. If your screenshot looks like every other screenshot, mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to sell your game because people won't recognize it or relate to it. It's why a lot of silly games that have like, uh, you know, rabbit with a gun or something is going to work because you're going to be, look at that and go, that's that game. I've seen that game because it's so visually distinct to that game. So mm -hmm. whatever it is, just make sure that it's got a unique identity. Yeah, that's true. Also, after my first project, I fall in love with this field and I, created this YouTube channel and so on. But then I was like, oh, hold on. I only used assets that were already made. I've used code mostly using ChatGPT. And I was like, I feel very guilty. And I feel like maybe it's not really what I want to do in the future. But at the same time, the passion was still there. And honestly, that's entirely fine. I think my my one complaint, and I say this a lot, is there's, there's storefronts like Steam. And to me, Steam should have products. And if what you've made is for you to learn, that's great. Don't put it on the storefront, put it on itch. That's what it's for. Game jams mm -hmm. are for learning, for getting better. I have no problem with people using any kind of assets and doing whatever it is they want to learn. But I think there has to be a difference between I'm doing this for fun or I'm doing this as a product. If I'm doing this as a product, I need to respect the audience that's buying the product. And so I need to make it and put the effort in and oftentimes the money in to make something. Um, if, if I'm like, it, it's going to cost some level of investment. Uh, I've, I've seen this before with people trying to find teams in discords. They might join a community and say, how do I get developers to work with me on my project? Because I need more help. And the answer is, why should they? And not in a mean way, but like, what are you offering them? If you're the idea person, then you're basically saying, do this for me for free. It's like, you need to provide something to them. What are you giving into it? And if people aren't willing to invest in their own projects, why would other people? And so if someone tells me they're not willing to buy custom artwork for a thumbnail or custom whatever, it's like, well, if you won't invest in your project, then why would you convince other people to invest in your project? Um, and again, that's not for everything. There's like learning projects, but then there's products. If you're trying to get someone to give you money for something, you need to have put money in to get to be able to demonstrate that value. And so I think asset flips are perfectly fine. Um, just make sure that you're, you know, if, if you're using assets as they are, that's that's an itch game jam demo. If you if you want to put it on a storefront, I need to see someone as textured it themselves or learned how to make a cohesive style or 
match things together in a way that means they care about the project. Yeah, thank you very much. I feel less guilty now. <laughs> what keeps you motivated and inspired? I know you said that you need something new in order to continue, but besides that, what really keeps you motivated? Honestly, just the sheer complexity of game dev in, in a good way. Like there's it, because of that, because there's always something. Um, I love learning new things, and so. I can I could be working on some code for some AI thing and it's starting to stress me out. It's too complicated and I'm not really understanding it. And I can go, you know what? I'm going to go back to work on the UI. But now I can start going, okay, for the UI, let's research other games. Let's go to some of the UI websites and find some examples of other games. Or maybe I want to research gestalt theory of, of placement and you start looking into the UI themes. Or if you're doing animations and go, okay, well, how, how if I tween an animation on screen, how much should I animate it? And you start looking into, well, Apple have an entire style guide for how they use animations and Google have an entire style guide for how they do it. And, oh, they use this particular easing curve. No matter what it is you want to learn, there's always like more information and more things. So for me, um, and as a, as a random side note, it's why I used to play a lot of Overwatch because Overwatch is the kind of game where you could play for 100 hours as one character. And if you switch to a different character, the game has changed. Like where you should stand is different. The characters you should be going after are different. The characters you're afraid of are different. The characters that are easy for you to attack are different. The, the level now moves differently if you're flying or moving or can you jump or can you dash. And so I liked that game because it had 30 something characters. And every time the game would get stressful or annoying or I wasn't really feeling it, I'd just jump to a different character and I would have a whole new game, a whole new universe to learn from. And so for me, games is, is the ultimate, like every art form. You, if you, if you want to work on games, but you're getting stressed by games, read Stephen King's book on writing because it'll help you be a writer, which will help you be better for writing, which will help you write better for games. And so there's always, it doesn't matter what you're interested in, you'll learn something that'll help you in game stuff. And that's, that's keeps me motivated is I just have to find some way of making it fun for myself. And it, that's easy in games. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. And I also didn't know about Overwatch. I used to see a lot of videos with it, not really clicking them and watching them, mm. but <laughs> yeah, now it's oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's one of those, I don't like multiplayer games. Like I would say don't like, I mean, I grew up playing Halo 3 and all the others and I played lots of multiplayer, but I don't, I don't play MMO as much. I don't play uh, lots of multiplayer games, but Overwatch like is such a standout for me. I play, I played thousands of hours of Overwatch. All my other games are single player narrative games. So this one game, it just hooked me in a way I couldn't really explain. And so I was researching it. I was like, why do I like this game? Like, I don't understand myself why I like this game. And so I started researching. It's like, okay, well, they've got sound design that's done really good here. And I like the level, I like the way the story stuff works. I like the way the characters stand. And I learned all about uh, combat stuff and did the whole, I read the art of war and how it applies to things. It's crazy. Like the whole lot of stuff is really interesting in terms of the philosophy of design. And it was a very interesting game. And I think that's, again, any anything ties into everything else. And for, for me, learning that game taught me a lot about the importance of sight lines and blocking geometry. And there's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't research by myself, but now makes sense in the context of learning for a game, you know? So Yama also says wave frame was like that for me, just switch frame weapons, bam, totally different mm -hmm. style. Yeah. And that, that's the great thing about games is like your playstyle can change drastically. Even a game like Hades, if you do a run with a different weapon, it's a completely different game. It feels completely different in terms of how you're going to approach problems. Is there a lesson you've learned along the way that you wish you would known when you first started? If we're being very technical with Unity, it would be figure out how to deal with scenes early. <laughs> That's one that I see a lot of people struggle and myself for years, because there's like 10 ways to do it. Um, some work, some don't, some work for small games, some work for big games. Find a solution that works for you early because I've, I've complained to Unity and about Unity a lot specifically that the basics you get in other engines aren't in Unity. You don't get a pause menu out the gate. You don't get scene switching. You don't get a settings menu. And so learning how to do those things are very important because you only really need one way to do them because most of your games will be the same, but you do have to learn them. They're a separate problem. So I would say learn early on how to manage the concept of your game state of like how you load scenes, how not to. And the, the thing I've mentioned before is I recommend doing that outside the life cycle of your game using this don't destroy on load with the runtime initialize function. There's loads of videos that'll cover that better than I'll be able to here, but that's the specific one. Um, if it's more broad, I would say that the number one thing I recommend people do is know if you're making a project to learn or a product, because if you're making a project to learn all the time you spend on, it's probably valuable in some degree, but if you're making a product, a lot of that time can be wasted. And if you don't picture yourself sitting there and money falling out of your back pocket the whole time you sit there, 
you're like you're going to end up spending a lot of time and this isn't to be like saying games can't be fun but my point is one of the most depressing things i see and i see it far too often is people who spend a year to three years working on one project and either don't release it or they do release it and 50 people play it and i don't want to see that i don't want to see people waste their life on something and be you know heartbroken when it doesn't work and the truth is it's because there's too many things to learn and some of that stuff you only learn by putting a game out or having people play it and so that when people say make small games they're not doing it to be mean they're saying if you make too something too big you're, you're like it's like trying to run a really long distance the amount of times you could trip there's loads of them but if you make a small journey you can only trip once or twice and you can learn how to not trip and you're learning how to get better in wider distances if you take too big of a project you'll probably trip somewhere, but you won't know you've tripped until you release it and it doesn't turn out the way you want to. And then that might kill your enthusiasm to make games ever. And I would rather see people make small things that aren't as cool as they want, but lots of them, until they suddenly realize they're good enough to make the thing they want, than picking to something too big and then failing at it. And so having a goal that's short, that's kind of defined, there's something called smart project management. Um, specifically, each project should be specific. Um, and you can go through the whole thing of measurable and whatever. But the point is, there's a set of rules for how you'd make something that's actually achievable, <laughs> that's doable, um, and try to do that. Try to pause every so often and say, am I actually achieving a goal? Otherwise, years will go by and you'll you'll be angry at yourself and you won't achieve what you want to. So the small goals, the small games thing, it isn't a meme. And there's not a reason every creator says it, but legitimately, if you, if you don't listen to it, you will end up being the person making a video telling someone else to do it later. I feel like creating something bigger because I only did two small projects and I feel like I really want to create this two hour gameplay or well, something you know, like that. Bigger is fine, That's... but like I said, the trick is to say, where am I comfortable? Find mm -hmm. something you're comfortable at and add one extra com complication, like adding a high scoreboard, because that'll, that'll require you to learn how to do the network stuff and set all of that up and whatever, or localize your game. So add, add the thing so it can be run in multiple languages. Each one of these is a problem that'll turn out to be a lot bigger than you think it is. And it might might not feel like a bigger game, but there's loads of ways to make your game bigger. Again, adding multiple levels, or maybe I'm gonna add a boss to it or add three levels or something, three different like distinct areas or new mechanics. Like bigger doesn't necessarily mean it has to be huge. It just means take thing, pick one thing slightly bigger and just push the boundary. But if you if you try to like make something too big, it'll always be like, everything will always get larger than you think it will. So if you pick something that sounds too easy, it'll turn out to be just about right. <laughs> So you want to make sure that you're picking something just at the edge of where you think it is and always push yourself just a little bit further. Also, Suyama asks, why is there so few open source games? There are a lot of engines, but not the games, unlike other software projects where there are a lot of open source tools. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the main ones is just the fact that if it's indie games, then it's because, quite frankly, if you're an indie, your three quarters of your code is probably the same for a lot of games. Like a lot, you'll notice a lot of games are very similar when they, from, from indies that they have like same style or the same camera or something. And so they're not going to give away the source code of the thing they're actually working with. AAA studios are never going to do it because they're not in control of the code. The people who write the games are not the people making the games or releasing them or producing them. And so they don't have the rights to do that. There's some games that are come out years and years later after the licenses have lapsed, but you're not going to ever see the code for those. I just don't think it's as valuable as people think. Like. There actually is a lot of open source stuff out there, and there's also a lot of decompiled games if you want to go hunting for them. Um, and you can learn how to decompile games as well if you really want to go down that road. Um, it's not that hard. It's actually just like some YouTube videos that'll teach you how to see the source code. I used to I used to look at how certain games would work. Like I played um, Death's Door, was a game I really enjoyed. And out of, just for fun, I decompiled the source code, learned how the save files worked, and I wrote my own thing to write my own save files for the game. Just as like a, would it be fun if I could? Um, like you can do these things and they're not that hard to do. Um, but to my point earlier, if I give you the a finished something that doesn't teach you how to make it, you know, with the game engine, it's, it's you're you have to build every step of the way up. So if I hand you a burger, you don't know how to plant vegetables, right? There's nothing, nothing about giving you a burger is going to show you how to plant vegetables. And so you need to learn the actual steps that get you there. And so it's not as useful as people think. And even if you did have the exact code and were like able to learn it, the way they did it might not be the way that actually recommend you do it. It's just the way they had to do it because of the situation they were in or the time budget or something else. There's a lot of reasons. And then separate from all of that, it's just a very personal thing. Like the people who made Celeste released their character controller and everyone makes fun of it. Now, in some cases, rightfully so, because some of it's terrible, but the truth of the matter is they delivered a product and a good product and the code doesn't matter. As I always say, nobody plays your code, they play the product. But the point is they got a lot of unnecessary hate online for releasing something 
that everyone loved the game, but everyone got angry at them because they released the source code. So there's no benefit to do that. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons why it's just not as beneficial or as kind of nice to release the code as people think it is. So I, I wouldn't, I, I don't see a world where that happens very often. Yura says multiple games also often guide you through how they make things. That's, a, that's another mm -hmm. good point too. Yeah, like you may not get access to the source code, but if you follow, there's so many like Unite talks or GDC talks, you'll, you'll be able to see full looks of things. If you want to see how the Elizabeth character in Bioshock Infinite, all that complicated AI works, they'll show you. There's an entire two hour video and they'll talk you through where they place markers. If you want to learn how the dialogue system in Firewatch works, there's an entire video that talks about that. If you want to learn how uh, Inside is one of the highest like performance wise games in Unity uh, on multiple platforms, they'll talk through all of the modifications they did and all of the different really neat tweaks to not using vectors and only using floats in certain areas for things just to like get the most performance for level loading. So they're not secrets. Like people think the, the, the companies aren't hiding the information from you. It's just the code isn't going to be as practical for you as some of the little bits of information that you can find if you're, if you kind of do the homework, you know? Yeah. So these were my questions. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing your insights and experiences with us. We appreciate you taking the time to join and look forward to seeing how your work continues to inspire both new and seasoned developers in the industry. Best of luck with your future projects. And hopefully you will be back on the main channel because I, I didn't yes, know about the we're, second we're one. Working on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. I'll, I'll hopefully get something fun out of it. I'm, I'm currently thinking about doing some stuff that's um, a bit more on... I've been thinking a lot about state and save files and I've been kind of... I want to do something fun where I explain binary stuff and how the save files work, how compression works and how to do different kinds of save formats and memento pattern. There's a lot of fun, there's stuff there that I'm kind of thinking about doing something on. So we'll see if I can come up with a fun video. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to see it. Um, thank you very much. And thank you also guys for being here and for all these interesting questions. It was a pleasure and yeah, hopefully we will collaborate in the future. Who knows? Thank you very much also for joining my live streams and suggesting me interesting things for my small games. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.